excited about this. And uh, again, I'm Marissa Guananha, Program Officer at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, um, and joined by Pamela Alexander, Director of Community Development at the Ford Motor Company Fund. Uh, Michelle Arrington, uh, State and Local Governor, Government Affairs at Verizon. And David Jakubowski, uh, CEO and co-founder at Eureka. So I'm not going to go deep into our panelist bios as we're short on time and we want to dive right in. Um, but please make sure to check out their bios uh, on the website. Just, let's kick it off um, and let's go in the order that I introduced you all, if that's okay. So it'll be Pamela, Michelle, and David. Um, and uh, just wanting to hear about how you and the organizations that you are representing are thinking about this moment and using this moment to create positive change uh, and support a just and inclusive economy. So Pamela, I'll hand it off to you. Um, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Marissa, for, for, for moderating today. And and this these times are, I'm with Ford Motor Company Fund, which for those of you who aren't as familiar, is the philanthropic arm of the motor company. Um, we invest globally in more than 50 countries, primarily in programs and supporting nonprofits around social mobility. Um, I'm passionate about social mobility. You know, if you're born in the bottom 20%, you have a 4% chance of making it to the top. That's not an acceptable number. Um, so a lot of the programming that we do has been and will continue to be built around social mobility. In the past few weeks um, with COVID and, and the social justice issues that have um, been very prominent around the world. For us at Ford, it's something that we've been doing for a while. We've been invested in a program called Men of Courage, Ford Men of Courage that we started five years ago um, in anticipation of and in response to issues around perceptions uh, around African-American men and that dialogue. So when you ask Marissa, what are we doing in, in light of the current crises and, and, and what's going on in the world, as it relates to COVID, you know, that, that hit our world very quickly. And, and the immediate response was, what can we do now? Now, 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 what can we do? And of course, a lot of that was just immediate needs and food and things like that. And we've taken like a, a now near far strategy to that. Um, and in the midst of COVID, of course, we have the social justice issue. Um, for us, we've been invested in, in these programs in a while. So it's not about money and it's not about a check. Uh, words matter. And, and money is important, but for us, it's really about continuing to do what we've been doing for many, many years um, around Men of Courage and around a lot of our programs, which are all about access and opportunity. Um, as the previous speaker mentioned, you can't talk about racial equity without talking about economic equity. So our areas of focus, uh, especially right now, are expanding what we're doing in the areas of racial and social equity, but also focusing on those economics because you can't, you can't divide the two. Thanks, Pamela. Michelle, can I hand it over to you? Hi, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Thank you all so much um, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, you know, around the conversation in regards to what Verizon is doing, it's once again what we've always been doing. Uh, when COVID-19 hit, as you can imagine, for a telecommunications company, we saw a huge increase in our network. Everyone's working from home and now homeschooling. So one thing that highlight that really um, was highlighted for us was the digital divide. It's an issue that we've always worked on, but it really came into play in the request for access in rural areas. Um, and even here in the city where I am in Atlanta, in regards to access to devices, technology, and hotspots. And it's something we've been committed to. Verizon has Verizon Innovative Learning Labs um, across the country. And what we do is we go to Title I schools in the middle school areas, and we work one-on-one -on -one by providing devices, technology, and support in order to build a next generation of tech leaders. You know, we would love to have it everywhere in every city around the country, but it's a star. It's hundreds of schools. And it's something that we continue to work on. We continue to support our frontline workers, our healthcare workers, and we knew how important this time was. When we saw the increase in demand, Verizon rose up to really address those issues. And we will continue to do this. Beyond COVID-19, we know that we have to work to continue to bridge the digital divide. Um, that's lobbying our lawmakers as well and helping us to address those gaps and doing more um, within our local communities. Um, around the issues of, of social justice and, and, and racial inequity, Verizon has always been at the forefront. I've been here for about six months now and I've been blown away even before 
um, everything that's really just has happened with Verizon's commitment to social justice. So Verizon is committed to lobbying um, on both state and federal levels across the political aisles in regards to expunging criminal records. We sponsor a uh, um, political criminal justice series. And Verizon has always done that. Um, in February, we had a huge Black History Month program featuring Congresswoman Lucy McBath. She came to speak. But we also talked about uh, a minority male leadership program that Verizon has implemented here to get Verizon employees, minority males, um, to the next level. Now, beyond uh, I guess the the you know the pandemic within the pandemic that we are absolutely seeing and being here in Atlanta, being on the ground, our company has committed ten million dollars um, to racial and social economic and social justice uh, organizations. But these are organizations we've always supported: the NAACP, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, Urban League. We've always worked with these organizations, and now our conversation has continued. I'm so appreciative of our CEO Hans that our conversation has continued about how we continue to do this each and every day and on the ground, how we're gonna support local organizations and make a real true impact. Thanks, Michelle. Um, David, I'll hand it over to you. Sure. Um, about four years ago, uh, I had the distinct pleasure of meeting a woman who many of you may know, uh, Melissa Bradley. Uh, and I began to um, volunteer with her as she began to, uh, uh, frankly, educate me about the, um, the digital divide, about the access divide. And so I became a mentor and she asked me to help um, three women of color um, raise capital. Uh, all three had uh, outstanding businesses um, that uh, on the surface I looked at and thought, geez, this is frankly uh, gonna be easy. I'm, uh, I've raised a lot of money. I've done a number of startups. I have a lot of connections in the venture capital world. And Melissa asked me to, to work with these three women and help them raise money. And my experience was, um, was shocking and frankly disgusting. Um, I brought them in, I made introductions. Uh, every one of the VCs had some impact fund uh, initiative uh, that they plastered all over their website and on PowerPoints, and uh, and I brought them women. I brought them women in. I had worked with them. I knew their pitches. I knew their business was cold, uh, and these were all fundamentally strong, growing uh, companies that would check every box. Um, the the ex that experience and the answer that they got um, was the worst possible answer you could get from a venture capitalist. Um, which is, uh, I really, they all got the same answer. I really like your business. Um, and I'd be uh, interested in getting in around if you had somebody else uh, who was the lead investor. Mm -hmm. That's worse than a no. Uh, a no says, uh, and you can ask questions about a no. And a no you can learn from and you can grow and evolve your business in a pitch. That frankly says, I don't know you, I don't trust you, and I want somebody else that I know to trust you before I'm willing to trust you. And I knew exactly what that answer was. And what I found myself having to do was go have a series of hard conversations with my white male counterparts uh, in the investment community. And I didn't like the answers that I got. Needless to say, this was not a surprise to Melissa Bradley. Um, and that began uh, a friendship in a journey where I found my role um, as the ally to begin to break the access barriers. Uh, so much so that I decided to dedicate the next phase of my career on it. And I've started a company with Melissa called Eureka. Eureka is a community of people set up specifically to do that, to bridge the gaps and to create allies across um, two primary vectors. One, getting access to capital. Every month we bring a new set of um, minority uh, entrepreneurs into um, the, the seats of, of investors. We screen them, we work with them, I sit with them. And frankly, my role is to call the bullshit uh, 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 across these things um, so that we can begin to actually make some, some progress. And that's the role that I've that I've had to embrace. And the second is uh, I've built some of the, the world's largest um, digital uh, advertising systems. And it's to, it's to begin to bridge the access gap for the best practices of what it takes to market in a world that most of the decisions stem from something that happens on, on a phone. 
Uh, I, I've lived in my very privileged Silicon Valley bubble for a long time, and I took for granted all of the best practices and the tips and the tricks. And uh, I, I'm here to help democratize that. And we set up a community, Eureka, um, to do that, and I'm dedicating the next part of my career to this. Wow. Um, thank, thank you all for, for sharing your stories so far. So I have a couple of questions. So one is around, uh, I mean, Michelle, you, you talked about this, about sort of Verizon um, make, taking a public stance on public policy issues that are connected to social justice. And I think, you know, Ford has also done, and David, I think this is, you know, I, used to, uh, I know Melissa Bradley, I know that that she also takes these these public stances, but I'm wondering for, um, it, 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 there's a perception that it, that is a risky move to, to, to take stances on issues of public policy. And so I'm wondering, you know, for whoever wants to take this, you know, what, what did it take for you to move your company or your leadership to take these public stances? So I'm a data-driven person. Uh, fundamentally, I'm a geek. Uh, I'm rooted in products and data and I, sift through numbers all day if you let me. Um, and so uh, if you straight up look at the numbers, if we do not do something to help the fastest growing population, the, the group of people who are creating companies at a rate three to six X higher um, than, than, the, than the rest of, of, of the population, if we don't help the group who we rely on to create jobs for the future, those jobs won't exist. Look, the what's been going on in the world over the last several weeks and frankly decades uh, is no surprise to a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the, the people on this uh, on this call. And it's a world that m uh, my parents uh, uh, hand, handed to me, and that their parents handed to them, and it's been systemically building. And so if I just flat out look at the numbers, the world that we are going to hand to our children is going to continue to get worse. The divide is gonna to continue to get worse, and the, uh, and the ability for the average person to have a fighting chance at a living wage job is going down, not up. And so it, it doesn't, so to me it wasn't about what, what is bravery or what is it? It's my responsibility as a parent uh, to create a world um, that is better than the one that I was given to hand to my children. And I am extremely lucky and very blessed uh, to be in a position both professionally um, uh, and with my own family that, that I can do this work. So for me, it, it, it's, not, it's not a choice, it's an obligation. Yeah, I, I would add to that as well. I mean, I think, you know, you can't say that you want to do business in a community and then not invest in that community. And that means community engagement. Um, and so that's one thing the Verizon has been intentional about um, uh, across the board and putting people in positions that can engage the community. We don't know everything. So it's up to us to go to local organizations, go to the startups, the entrepreneurs, the small businesses that are on the ground and to say, hey, we want to work with you to build long term sustainable partnerships. And when you do that and invest in the community, I mean, one is a smart business model. You build really good relationships. But beyond that, you really are building something for it for the future. I mean, I I'm very I'm fortunate to be working at this company because it wasn't something that we jumped on a bandwagon with. It was something that was already being done. And so we're able to really continue that messaging and helping the next generation. If you're not helping communities of color, but you want communities of color to be your customers and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. We, we have a, a corporate responsibility um, to really be involved in and to give back to communities. And that means partnering with them and giving them access and opportunity. Right. I would agree 100 percent. You know, it's, it's a smart business move. I mean, that's that's the first answer is, is because you have to invest. If I look, for example, at Ford's minority suppliers, um, not just the large ones, but the requirements we have that they also have minority sub suppliers um, and growing those businesses and those small businesses. That's key. And my role where I oversee the grants to nonprofits throughout the U.S., it's also about, frankly, just doing the right thing. Um, and, and that's part of who we are. You know, I, I share Michelle's at Ford. I really appreciate that's where we where we've been. Um, that's why Ford Fund is so invested. 
it is about doing the right thing. And when you talk about making statements, as I said, words matter and words are important, but it's about backing them up um, as much as it is about making a statement. And, and that's something that we have always done and will continue to do because sometimes it is just about doing the right thing and investing in people and investing in communities. Because as David said, if you want to do business there, and Michelle said, you have a responsibility um, to engage in the community. Yeah, and I'm, Pamela, I'm glad you mentioned your supply chain because one of the questions I was going to ask, mm -hmm. in particular, Michelle and Pamela, is that <laughs> the purchasing power, right, of Ford and Verizon and a lot of these large corporations is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and presumably, there's a, a lot of impact that you can have in, in your procurement policies, in your supplier diversity. Um, and so, you're know, wondering how your organizations are engaged in that work. And is that something that you're looking at as well? And it sounds like Pamela, from your perspective, yes, and Michelle. Yes, um, I'm, you know, I'm very proud and Ford is very proud of our minority supplier programming that we've been recognized for and received all kinds of awards because it's very deep. It's very, there's a very strong commitment there. Um, as I mentioned, not just with the large minority suppliers, but with the sub suppliers um, to really make sure that there are opportunities there both in terms of economic and opportunity and also how we are able to share knowledge, um, share capacity building uh, to help businesses grow. And then when we incorporate that, that mindset into what we do at Ford Fund, Ford Fund traditionally has it's given very traditional grants to nonprofits. Over the past several years, we've really evolved that into social impact investing where we're helping nonprofits grow and, and look at a different way of getting grants, but also social entrepreneurship. Um, we have programs for female social entrepreneurs. I don't need to tell anyone on the call about the lack of access, and David, you spoke to it, um, in terms of capital for those, for those entrepreneurs. Uh, her, impact, her impact program, our Empower Change program, we developed specifically to invest in those small businesses in terms of capacity and in terms of funding um, to help them grow. And I think we have a few of them on the call today, so shout out to my Her Impact and, and Empower Change uh, women. But we've been involved in that and even on a global scale, um, sponsoring challenges around the world because you have to help, have to provide resources for those entrepreneurs so that they can grow to become the suppliers and the sub suppliers and the other businesses we need. Yeah, um, at Verizon, supplier diversity um, and inclusion is really business imperative. So in the last 10 years, we spent over $50 billion investing um, into diverse suppliers. And when you do that, they drive the fresh ideas, right? They drive the innovative solutions that really connects Verizons to customers. So once again, we're able to expand our business because we're investing into economic development growth um, in regards to giving to smaller uh, businesses, entrepreneurs and startups. I definitely want to highlight it and shout out three um, organizations that are familiar with us. So Cap, we work with the Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Uh, Jay Bailey runs that. We work with Goody Nation, um, Joey Womack, and the Center for Civic Innovation run by Rohi. And these organizations come to us and say, hey, we're working with these entrepreneurs, these startups, these small businesses, and we help fund them and they get us there. And that's a part of, of being smart about what you do. We don't know all of the organizations, but there are businesses and minority businesses and entrepreneurships and innovation and tech centers that are doing the work on the ground. So why aren't we working with them so they can introduce us to the next generation? And I, I love that partnership and it's a smart business model for corporations to have. Thank you both. David, a question for you that's popping up within the comments here is, you know, that there's, uh, you know, for a lot of folks, um, the, the businesses that they are pitching or, or, or might not be traditional businesses or, or, in, uh, or what a, a traditional VC might look, look at. And so what is the work that needs to be done um, to sort of expand what a traditional VC would look like, look at as a potential investment? Yeah, I sort of have two answers to that. The, the venture capital world is like this tiny little um, slice of the, the overall finance world. And no matter what lens you look at, they've always had a relatively small slice of, of the, the patterns um, that, that they invest in. Now, the thing that was unique about my story is that all three companies specifically fit that, that, that pattern. And, and if, and if I, and if I saw that, you know, just imagine how big the iceberg under that little, that, that little, that little tip was. Um, and so I think a lot of it starts with financial literacy. 
um, and that there's a that there needs to be an understanding of what are the various forms of capital um, that are available because just it, it, in all of the companies um, that get fu that get funded if you if if you take um, if you take even just take the buy side and, and, and the the total numbers of it venture capital is, is this tiny slice and so. Um, so I think that there's, it starts with what are all the different things that have become available? And one of the things that we're most excited uh, about is what's going on in crowdfunding. And we've done um, a couple of partnerships in that space, and one in particular with an organization um, called Start Engine, and we're bringing our first uh, company through uh, to that to that program, and they're bringing a different perspective of investor to the table. And so that, that gets into kind of kind of my 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 second play is is the one of the things that we're focused on at eureka is you have to demonstrate that it's profitable that you make more money um by working by working with um these communities and by working with entrepreneurs that have been traditionally overlooked um then uh then you do if you don't just straight up, if you look at the numbers, um, it, you, you know, you could say you, you look at it and say, well, it's a negative that the valuations are, are not as high. Well, as an investor, that couldn't be a better thing. And so we have to start expanding the universe of who those investors are and the ways in which, in which we go about it. Um, and so we've had, frankly, more success uh, doing two things expanding the base of investors and thinking about it as not traditional venture capital. And then the second is, uh, is, is working with this whole new area um, that, is, that has happened in seed and A round financing as traditional venture has kind of moved more to look like private equity. And we have brought those folks in um, and began to, to create safe spaces for them to meet with companies who don't look like the traditional venture capitalists uh, and explore royalty-based deals uh, and lots of uh, different traditional models. In fact, there's, we have a program, Eureka Connect. Every month, um, we, we help um, a, a series of companies find money that don't come from traditional venture spaces. So the first is financial literacy. There are grant programs, there are loan programs, there's equity-based, there's debt-based, um, and then there's royalty-based. And then the second is expanding the pool of who those investors are beyond what is the traditional Sand Hill Road style VC. I muted myself, sorry. Um, so David, thank you for that. Michelle and Pamela, did you have anything to add on, on that particular piece? A around sort of the investing in, um, you know, how, how people are viewing the, the the businesses that they're coming in and investing in. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 much like David, we work with uh, 1863 Ventures and Melissa Bradley on on uh, our her impact program, which we just we just held in Miami, um, the most recent one. You, you, I agree with you, David. You have to. Um, it's very important to us to make that cap access to that capital available. But it's about the capital, but it's also about the um, capacity building and the support, which is why a lot of the programs and the programs that we do are around. Uh, capacity building and preparing businesses for success as much as about the capital as well that we provide. Yeah, and I, I would just add access yeah. to uh, relationships and people in the room. Um, the one thing we do in regards to our community engagement plan is we look at pain points in every area. So Atlanta, mm -hmm. you're income inequality, right? That is number one in Atlanta. We're looking at um, poverty and homelessness and issues of pain points that uh, really affect us. And then we're looking at organizations that match up with those and having community talks with these organizations and they're being introduced to Verizon, we're being introduced to them. And even if we don't wind up supporting or funding something that they're doing, they're able to connect with other innovators in the room and other entrepreneurs and tech startups. And I think that's important. Um, and it's important to have women of color and people of color in positions like this so that we can bring diversity uh, to the room in regards to small businesses. One thing that we did um, during COVID-19, we gave away uh, $7.5 million for small businesses um, through a, a national nonprofit LISC. And so small businesses from hair salons to barber shops to, you know, the local wing spot were getting $10,000 each and they were really impacted and we were allowing them to, to make a difference. Um, once again, when you're this huge corporation, what are you doing on the ground locally? And that's what you really have to think about. Yep. 
David, I have a question. How do you bring more of your peers, white men with access to power, um, into this conversation mm -hmm. and as allies? Yeah, that's uh, that's a tough question. Um, uh, you know, I, I think most people would be surprised at uh, at how many folks have a desire to do something. Um, I, I think that um, th that there's a, a couple of things that that we need to do. One that Eureka is specifically trying to do is just frankly making it easier, um, making it easier for them to to take a few hours out of their day uh, to work with a company to help them. Uh, fundamentally, um, what I found is that when whenever there's a human to human connection. Um, magic things happen. And when we can get somebody to take an hour of their day uh, and meet with an entrepreneur that they ordinarily wouldn't even know existed, and they find out the human being behind it, how hard they've worked, frankly, that they're scrappier, that their economics are a better on a unit basis um, than what they're traditionally seeing in that category, uh, simply because they've had to, uh, the, the level of dedication and hard work um, translates through to a human to human. So making more uh, human to human connections and, and bridging gaps uh, to would be at, would be allies um, is a is a big first step. Like that's like the small step uh, for man that we can begin to begin to take every day uh, to play off of uh, Neil Armstrong a little bit. Um, but the but the more systemic problem. Uh, isn't going to get better until we demonstrate that there's money to be made uh, and the economics of not investing uh, in, uh, in this community um, becomes scarier than investing. Uh, and so uh, we want to create uh, examples where it's extremely profitable and where people have made uh, a lot of money. Um, because they can, they, they work with these companies. And if the companies are growing, making money, then the investment community, the investment base, um, uh, makes, makes money. But if those companies aren't growing and, and doing well, that can't be true. So we have to solve the macroeconomic, macroeconomic problem. And that's not as daunting as in practice as it, as it sounds here as I'm describing it. The three or four best practices that I typically work with uh, and that Eureka has a uh, has a program um, uh, that we do that we work with the we can we can go set in and just provide the access get people connected, get them to the best practices and, and get them fed through to the right customers. And the average company that comes through, comes through that program in about four months has almost a 50% increase uh, in revenue. Simple, basic, fundamental access points, the huge difference to, differences to these companies and the leadership and, and the, the people behind them are very capable. If you just eliminate the barrier, the ideas aren't any different. They're not any better or worse. The people, frankly, work harder. So there's all of these fundamental uh, underlying strengths that are already there that, that by simply um, removing access barriers and applying best practices help growth. And growth is where money is made. And the macroeconomics are what's going to change this systemically. Thank you. Um, I think we're at, at, at time. Uh, do any final thoughts from any of our panelists? Um, I would just add, you know, we have to continue to have a conversation, but we also have to have an action plan. And I, I think that's so important um, in regards to moving it forward. So we have to continue, you know, to vote. I think Stacey Abrams just said it today in Georgia, we're voting. If you haven't done that, stay in line and make sure you vote. But we also have to continue to use as a corporation, use our organizational capacity to invest our dollars. We have to support economic and, and uh, workforce development programs. We have to give to communities of color and we have to continue to bring people people into the room, give them access to corporations, hear their voice and invest into our next generation. Right, I agree 100%. It's about access, it's about opportunity, and it is about real action. Um, and making sure that we, as to, to somewhat to your last question, that we have a, a variety of people in the room. I know as we've engaged more in social entrepreneurship and pitch competitions, it's really important that we get a people, a group of judges, for example, in the room that can see different things and see different perspectives. Um, it's about action and it's about all of us participating and fully engaging um, with money, with words and with action on this one. 
Great, and so thank you all for 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 your time here. You know, and I I would just add, I think you know, there's the human to human connection, David, that you talked about. We all talked about, or everyone talked about access. Michelle, thank you for bringing up the civic engagement part that needs to happen in in the voting. Um, you know, I think there's another piece of this which is gets to the structural, which is rewriting the rules uh, of how the economy works, um, uh, which is a much bigger uh, policy conversation uh, 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 than we have time for here. But I think that's just another layer that that we can't uh, forget about, right? Uh, governance, antitrust, I mean, all, all of the rules that, that govern our economy. Um, so again, thank you all for your time. Um, and I think I'm handing it back over to someone on Spectrum. Thank you so much for that wonderful panel. Uh, I want to thank you to our panelists for the powerful conversation. Uh, a poll has just been launched. Um, we would love you to engage in that uh, as we prepare ourselves to go into our breakout sessions. So we have, um, we're inviting you to join one of three breakout sessions. The breakout sessions are really intended to curate a set of concrete, actionable steps that can be taken up by leaders and communities towards a more equitable entrepreneurial landscape. Uh, for communities of color. Each session will be mod moderated by a field leader and your conversation will be guided by a facilitator who will track your actionable steps. At the end of the day, we'll come back and share key insights from the breakouts. Uh, again, there are three uh, different uh, breakout sessions. One is focused on capital allocators, and this is geared towards organizations and individuals that are, that are capital allocators. Join this conversation to focus on concrete steps for how to move capital, more capital, to founders and communities of color, and what needs to change, be built, or created. This session will be facilitated by Marco Gonzalez with Vamos Ventures. The second interactive breakout um, is, is focused on enterprises and will be moderated by Pedro Sostre, uh, the founder of Weblift, and it's geared towards companies and entrepreneurs to focus on concrete steps of how best to support founders and leaders of color and what needs to change, be built, or created. And then last, we have a session for innovators. Um, innovators are a critical piece of the ecosystem that connect and support different sectors. And so this session will be focused on access and will be moderated by Brian Goebel uh, from the Emory University, University Goizeta Business uh, Center. Uh, we will rejoin or reconvene at about uh, 2.15. Uh, and so we just thank you and enjoy your um, breakout sessions. <laughs>